The Legacy of Wisdom Project gathers and publishes answers to many of humanity's most pressing questions from some of our most experienced and profound leaders. How do I find my mission to feel complete and fulfill my life's potential? This is such a wonderful question because this is hindsight. You know, I thought my mission was this, and it turned out that I was deployed in a different way. So when I have the hindsight, that's when I find out what my mission was. Remember the the Vonnegut book um, that he has about the Bocononians. I can't wait until I find out what my Wampeter was, who the people were, my Karas. These are the kinds of things we see at the end of life. I just came back from a meeting in St. Louis. Travel is hard on me, and so that's the result of that. I'm not feeling too well in my body at this point. But there were over 150 people who I had ordained. This was a rabbinic association of the people who are Jewish renewal rabbis. And you can understand how wonderful it was for me to see what they're accomplishing. Because about 12, 13 years ago, I started to turn things over more and more to them. Because I'd watched some other gurus, leaders, who were in the saddle until they died. That wasn't such a good idea. And I felt, because I've seen how they go to seed when they can't, the people who are eager to work. And uh, so, I moved back and back and back all the time, and uh, they have been making fun of me how many watches I have for retirement. But it's working, and so that gives me a sense that I've done something, which was to make sure that there is another option for Jews who are more universalist to also be Jewish. So the late, the, one of my books is called Jewish with Feeling. And the publisher didn't have Seichel to follow me. Uh, I wanted to be called, if you're so universal, why be Jewish? Because that's a real question for people today. If they've read the Upanishads, they've read quantum mechanics, they've read this and that, uh, depth, depth psychology and, and transpersonal psychology, the question always comes up. Why should I remain a Jew? What is there that I have to do? So I've been teaching the people that every religion is a vital organ of the planet. And we now see, once we saw the planet from outer space, we understood that the only way to understand cosmology is organismically. You can't see it mechanically anymore. So if we are part of the organism Earth, then there can't be such a thing as triumphalism in religion, saying that Mashiach will come and all the Goyim will know they're wrong, or Jesus will come again and say, you Jews didn't listen to me, or the Imam, or the Avatar, whatever. But if you understand that the same way as a body couldn't be made all of liver, and needs a skeleton, and it needs the lungs, and it needs arms and legs. So it is with the body of earth. It needs all of us. We are indispensable to that. In order, and Jewish renewal is really saying that, that there is a new way of looking at cosmology and our place in the order of this organism called earth. And when I see the fruits of that, That gives me great satisfaction. If the question is, is there still something left for me? I'm working now on several things that I want to complete before my time comes. One is, when I wrote this book, From Aging to Saging, I really spent a lot of time on what I call the October months of life, the November, and I sketched in there is such a thing as the December years. And now I'm sitting with a person who interviews me like uh, Tuesdays with Maury thing. 
about um, the December years and what does it feel like when you become aware that your mitochondria are getting tired, that your body, there's a steeper curve of uh, um, descent, as it were, of body stuff. And how does mind go at that point? And it goes in two directions. It goes larger, vaster, and at the same time, when you're not feeling well, there's this regression into the ouchy body at that point. And as I've been counseling with people from time to time in hospice and so on, the important question for most of the people was, am I tired enough to let go? Because as long as I have something that I still want to do, I will overcome the tiredness. I want the child to be married. I want the book to be completed. So that's part of the December work. So I'm now carving out this material by introspection, how I feel and, and how it's happening to me, looking at the colleagues who are one after another going at this time, and uh, my uh, reflections on my interaction with them is also good, sometimes with regret, and sometimes it is wonderful that I shared so much with them. So that's one part. The other part is I've been working ever since I began on what I call davenology. What's davenology? Most of the time when people go to synagogues or churches, they spin their wheels. They're being told such and such a page, recite such things, and they're reciting but they're not worshiping or praying. In other words, the experiential thing isn't there. And that's what I've been working on all this time. But I haven't yet produced the book of that. So I have over 2,000 densely written pages that have to be condensed into a book. The working title for me, for me at this point is Handbook for the Davener. So that the person, davening, by the way, is a wonderful word. People don't know what it's derived from, but I believe it's from the word divinum, to do the divine thing. So, so I want to do this davenology thing. Those are the two things that are urgent. A third thing is a conversation I had with His Holiness the Dalai Lama. In Buddhism, you talk about the turnings of the wheel. There's the Theravada, the first turning. There's the Mahayana, second turning. Vajrayana, the third turning. And I confronted him, and I said, isn't it time that you should do the fourth turning of the wheel? Because your previous incarnation, or the Dalai Lama before you, was not friendly to people outside of Tibet. It was quite xenophobic. White devils and stuff like that. Now you are going to Madison Square Garden and doing initiation in the Holy of Holies of Tibetan, the Kala Chakra. And uh, what is it that you want to accomplish? Is this not the beginning of the fourth turning? And he says, for this you need to have Gautama himself to come back. There were people there, and I couldn't say as I would want to say, hey, Tenzin Gatsyo, you were just talking to each other. You are it, Buddhism out of a corner of Tibet and made it universal. So it's the same situation. If I'm so universal, why should I be Buddhist, right? So that has to do with the fourth turning. Hasidism has had three turnings. The first turn of Hasidism was the Sons of the Prophets and the Dead Sea Scrolls. That was the first part. The second one was the medieval people <coughs> in Germany, and in uh, North Africa. In Germany, it was um, um, Yehuda the Pious in Ratisbon, Regensburg, and uh, the children of Maimonides, who continued the work of Bach Ibn Pakuda, were doing, as they in Germany were doing a kind of how Christian monastics do it, so Jewish monastics do it in this form. And they were doing, as Sufis are doing, so Jewish Sufis are doing. 
And so I'm also working on a book on the fourth turning of Hasidism. Return again, return to the land of your soul. Return again, return again, return to the land of your soul.